Amanda Frederick. I'm the Program Communication Manager with Women Who Code. I'm super excited to be here with you today. I'm joining from Mexico City. It's about 9 p.m., um, but I know it's tomorrow for some of you. Um, I'm here today to introduce Ann Kilzer. She'll be um, presenting on Convenience in the Cloud, an AWS Architecture Crash Course. Um, and, you know, when I was reading Ann's bio, I finished and I said, wow, She's incredible. <laughs> so I'm going to read you her bio now um, so you can get to know her as well. So Anna is a creative problem solver whose work spans multiple disciplines from software engineering to visual arts. As a leader in the technology field, she champions equity and works to create belonging for underrepresented groups. Her determination and passion gets results from serving as the first engineer at a startup to a leap of faith move to Japan to build a new life, even though she hadn't found a job yet. She grew up in Montana, USA, and enjoys spending time in nature. In her spare time, she practices Japanese calligraphy, international cooking, and indigo dyeing. She currently works as a software architect at Salon Build, Japan, and volunteers as a senior director for Women Who Code Tokyo and APAC. So really excited to have you here today, Anne. And, um, Thank you. And we'll wrap up about 10 minutes and take questions. And we're super excited to hear from you. So this is Convenience and the Cloud, an AWS Architecture Crash Course. Thank you, Amanda, for the lovely introduction. And let's get started. So I'm going to use the metaphor of a convenience store, specifically a Japanese convenience store, to take us on this journey through learning about AWS. So what makes Japanese convenience stores different? Well, we shorten it to konbini because we like short words. And you know, yes, there are a place to buy snacks, magazines, small groceries, or your favorite beverage, but there's so much more. There are 56,000 operating in Japan. You can send faxes, do copies. Yes, we still use fax machines. You can get your resident certificate. You can withdraw cash, pay your bills. Um, it's just a cornerstone of daily life. I'm going to go pay my bike insurance later today. So they're just kind of everywhere. And you can just put in the chat, what does Amazon Web Services and Kimbini, what do they have in common? So if you have any thoughts, put in chat. Let me actually switch to the comments. Yeah, so um, what do they have in common? Well, I my answer is wide, perhaps overwhelming variety of options. Um, they're ever changing, always new, and they can make your life use they can make your life easier if used correctly. Today's agenda, we'll start off by talking about Amazon Web Services. Then I'm going to talk about toy problems, what I mean by that phrase. Uh, next, we'll go into a proposed architecture, and then in detail from back end to front. So we'll start with our database, DynamoDB, move into our compute layer of Lambda. API gateway, then front end website hosting on S3, getting it to your client with CloudFront and how we put it all together. Lastly, we'll talk about AWS certifications and further study. So let's talk about Amazon Web Services. This is on-demand on -demand cloud computing services. It was introduced in the mid 2000s and they have services such as compute, storage, machine learning, analytics, and networking. Uh, but don't you don't only get these resources, but you get some advice on how to use them widely. So there's a wealth of documentation. I've noticed too, if you give feedback on the documentation, a tech writer will come on along and improve it, which is great. They give a lot of example solutions on how to make it better. And they have these guiding principles called the well-architected framework to help build secure and robust solutions. One of the other advantages of AWS and other cloud services is you pay for what you use. Traditionally, if you were gonna start a company and scale up a business, like a tech company specifically, you would have to anticipate what kind of traffic you'd have, order servers, install them into racks, that would take months. Then if you have more clients and you need to grow again, you've got to wait another three months, hire a person to maintain it. You don't have to pay for the hardware cost anymore. You can just get in there and start. You can dynamically scale based on the day of the week. There's also a very uh, great free tier that's good for people who are just starting out, who are prototyping. 
and there's budgeting and cost tools to help you use the services effectively. The well-architected framework contains six pillars. It's Amazon's guide to best practices. The pillars are operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and sustainability. Sustainability here is in the environmental set, which is um, in the environmental sense and not in, a, in another context, but it is thinking about how much power are we using? How much carbon are we using? So this is really great that we're being good stewards to our planet. Um, I don't have time in this talk to get into depth on all of these, but there is great documentation on Amazon's website. I'm going to talk a little more about security and cost optimization because I think those are really important when starting out, because if you don't do those, there can be bad consequences. So those are some that I like to start with. Another guiding principle in AWS is we have compute power around the globe. So there are different regions and availability zones. We see there's Asia Pacific, uh, which is closest to probably most of the people at this conference. The regions are separate geographical areas for AWS compute resources. Within a region, you have various isolated availability zones. Which one should you use? Well, if you're just building something, a prototype that you're using yourself, Pick something close to you. I'm picking Asia Pacific Northeast one. Uh, if you want something robust, planet scale, fault tolerant, you will start using different availability zones or different regions. Make your data close to the client or make it in different places in case there's a power outage or some network issue. So you have a lot of choices here. And if you want the latest and greatest features, one in the USA will probably have the newest stuff. For cost and budgeting, again, this is one related to that, um, to the um, well-architected pillars. Um, you know, there's that free tier, and if you create a new AWS account for the first 12 months, you get some pretty good deals. There's other services that are always free. The cautions, though, I'd say is do check this out. Don't ignore it because if you in, incorrectly configure something and you allot a lot of compute power that you end up not using, you can end up paying a lot of money. You know, you can go from paying a few dollars to thousands of dollars with a couple clicks. So you have to be responsible. There are good built-in tools to help you use the tools widely. And if you're just brand new to this, go into the budgeting tool and set your maximum monthly spend. Say, I don't want to spend more than $5 a month. That's my limit. That's what I have. Go in there. It will give you an email or a text, and it will let you know when you're getting close to that budget. So they do give you the tools to use it wisely, but it is up to you to take that responsibility. Another important principle related to security is identity and access management. This gives us fine-grained permissions and guardrails. It's controlled via JSON policy documents, and basically it controls who, which is who as in a user or a compute resource acting in a role, can do what, what is a type of action, like read to the database, write to the database, download a file, see this configuration, and then where would be the specific resources. So it's very fine-grained, very powerful, and there's various entities that you'll learn about if you explore it more. A guiding principle in security that's useful for AWS, but just useful in all of computing is the principle of least privilege. We only want to give users or programs that are performing actions access to the minimal information and resources essential to do their job. So imagine you go, you're staying at a hotel, you get a key card, that key card should give you access to the room that you've rented and maybe common areas like the pool, the lobby, et cetera. Um, we don't want that key card to give us access to every single room for two reasons. One, malicious actors. We don't want someone to go in, take someone else's luggage, um, or just be, you know, where they shouldn't be. Another is sometimes we make mistakes. Maybe I went to the eighth floor instead of the ninth floor and I went into the wrong room. So, so some is up against malicious actors, but some is also just, we're human, we make mistakes. I'm particularly clumsy, so you know things happen. So if you're using AWS, 
Um, and especially when you start to use it more, don't give everyone, uh, or if you start to use it with other people, don't give everyone the root access account. You can create separate users and assign permissions via groups. So you can kind of limit the power and that's, that's protect you from making mistakes or that's also just to trust everyone. So next, let's talk about toy problems. So I went to um, grad school at UT Austin. I was in the PhD program, but I just I just got my master's. Um, and when I was in that place, I faced a lot of new challenges where we'd be exploring science. We'd have these really unbounded problems. Like in undergrad, oh, the project's due next week. You'd finish it, you'd get an answer. There maybe is a text a uh, textbook answer guide that would tell you if you were right or wrong, or your teacher could grade it really clearly. Um, this was unbounded. We would work on things that maybe would take a year and a half to work on a research paper. And it was an extension of another paper that took three years to work on. So it was just much broader. There wasn't that right answer. And we were pushing the boundaries of science. There was new territory. Now, AWS isn't so much the boundaries of science, but it is very vast. And there are almost, there are pretty much infinite configurations on what you can do with it. You can plug and you know, connect different things in new ways. So you'll have these really open-ended problems. And so we need a way to navigate complexity, otherwise we just drown in it. So put in the chat, would you rather, uh, and again, I'm a Japanese train nerd, but um, would you rather build a steam lo locomotive, understand, you know, water pressure and pipes and, you know, welding and track gauges? Do you want to learn all that? Or do you want to build a little toy and then gradually iterate on that toy? Which learning approach are you going to take if you have to become, you know, build something? You see in the chat, I think there's a delay, so. You can put toy if you'd rather build the toy. You can type SL if you want to take on the challenge and build the steam locomotive. I'll give my answer, which is I like to build the toy first. I like to start small and iterate. And when we build a toy, OK, yeah, now I'm seeing people are saying toy, 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 iterate, yeah. When we build a toy, we want to simplify and reduce scope as much as possible. So imagine you're building a distributed system. The minimum distributed system is two computers. You have one network cable between two computers. So you've reduced the parameters. I'm not thinking about 100. I'm thinking about two. You're going to cut unnecessary features. You're going to aim for good over great. Uh, another key point of making a toy problem we are honest that it's a toy. I don't go, hey, look, I built a steam locomotive. Look at how great it is. No, we enumerate the assumptions we made, and we're just very clear of the limitations of our system. Think of it a lot like a minimum viable product in industry or prototyping. So um, yeah, these guidelines we're going to apply now to, um... oh, well, yeah, one more point is just on avoiding complexity we'd have these metaphors we'd call like yak shaving or rabbit holes. They all basically just des describe different ways of overcomplicating things. But in grad school, we'd also use the word punt. And we say, hey, you're making it too complicated. We're going to punt it. We're going to kick it away and deal with it later. It doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean we're, you know, never going to deal with it. We just, we're going to deal with it later so that we can get our heads around the scope now. So I, I will use the little rugby icon anytime I kick away complexity just to deal with later. And it's a way I suggest for learning things of just making learning bite size and rather than drowning in complexity. So I want to build a toy e-commerce convenience store. And what I will need for my MVP, I'm going to need a product list, I'm going to need a basket, checkout, a UI, but let's just keep it minimal. It doesn't need to be the best one. I don't need a full UX designer. I'll just use material type stuff. And I want to follow the AWS well-architected best practices to some point because it is good to reinforce those. And if I don't do like basic security or cost, 
you know, I'm doing this on my company's um, AWS account. So there's a responsibility of not getting hacked, not racking up a big bill that someone else has to pay. Um, yeah, so those are the things I want. For the assumptions and restrictions, I'm going to assume I have one customer. It's me. And I'm not accessing it regularly. I go there maybe once a day. I'm not going to worry about authentication and payment handling at this point. And the product delivery, it will just be honest. Okay, you paid for it. Go get it. So that's the kind of bounds I'm putting to get started with this problem. For the proposed architecture, I wanted to use a number of AWS services. I wanted to try serverless so that I get more practice with it. So this is what it looks like. From the back end, we have DynamoDB, our distributed key value store. I'm using Lambda, a serverless option for compute, API gateway, and then for the front end is S3 and CloudFront. So I'm going to go a little bit into some of how these services work and then how I uh, use them. I think both are important. So first, I want to talk about scaling in distributed systems. So imagine we need a convenience store to serve more customers. Do we want to build like a big mega store, you know, beef up our convenience store and just double the size of it? Or would you rather build small stores and kind of put them in different places? This is very similar to the problem that Amazon faced in the mid 2000s when they were trying to scale up, I believe, an Oracle server. Uh, but the thing is, there's a certain point where they just can't keep scaling up a monolithic relational database. It just, there's just a point where you can't add more CPU or RAM. And so they started looking at different options like horizontal scaling. They wanted to add more compute nodes. Now this requires a little bit different logic because now we have to, monoliths are a little easier to model in our heads, but they don't scale. So if we can come up with an elegant way to distribute the database across different nodes, then we can scale infinitely. So they built um, this system and they tested it for a few years and then they published this paper. And one of the reasons this paper has really stood the test of time is they tested it in production with a huge customer base for years before they published it. So this SOSP, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's like a top tier systems conference. And um, it's a really good paper. I can't go in depth, but I encourage you to check it out. Uh, one of the influencers of the Dynamo that they built was they noticed that 90% of the operations that their engineers were using were on a single table. So they, they thought, you know, we don't actually need joins. We don't need this relational database. So this was one of the early players in the NoSQL space. And it's basically a distributed key value store. It had a big impact. It influenced other systems such as Cassandra and Reoc, and then DynamoDB. Now, Dynamo and DynamoDB share a name. Uh, DynamoDB is the AWS offering that we can all pay for and use. And while they share a name and some key concepts, like a very similar interface, the actual implementation is fairly different. So uh, that was a little surprising. There's a paper on DynamoDB that was published last year, also interesting, but they changed a lot of the architecture under the hood. Another key principle of distributed computing is availability. This means that all working nodes in a distributed system return a valid response for any request without an exception. Here we have a convenience store that was on my commute to work, went out of business, not available. Consistency is where each node in the distributed system has the same data at the same time. So we see they are all keeping track of the inventory on the shelf of onigiri and various snacks. Uh, Server C has a different view of the world, so it is not consistent with A and B. And usually we find that we can only get consistency or availability due to something called the CAP theorem. I don't have time to go into depth, but we're often choosing between strong consistency and then um, 
the availability isn't as good or eventual consistency where we have high availability. So when you use DynamoDB, you can choose between these two types of consistency. So strong is we always reflect the latest write operation, but you're going to pay more. It costs more. It's harder to implement. Eventual consistency is the default. You might wait a few seconds to get the data, but you know we can build applications that can deal with failure. And this was used in the original Dynamo paper because Amazon had one priority when they built their database. We want you to be able to shop as much as possible. We want to optimize for cart checkout. And they knew they had a good customer service team that could sort out any, any troubles if there was things, but they really prioritized that cart rights must always succeed. So let's get into it. Let's make a table. One of the different things about building a table in Dynamo versus traditional SQL is you will have to choose your key structure right at the beginning, and then you cannot change it. Um, you can throw away the table and build a new one, especially if you're prototyping, but we have to know the structure of our keys uh, when we get started. So I used to work in a grocery store 20 years ago, and um, you know barcodes and things are part of that. So I just thought, Convenience stores, they use barcodes that let's just use a similar structure. So the barcode format, this one is popular in many parts of the world. It's called EAN. It has the company prefix. Then it has a product number and check digit. And so I just did the partition key to be the company prefix. I made up some fake companies that sound Japanese. And I made a sort key. That's the product number and check digit. So it's going to be put on these different nodes in the distributed system based on these partitions and sort keys. You can just start building from the web UI. If you were in production, you would probably use a command line or Terraform or some sort of automated system. But for just getting started, just get in there and play with it. We make a new table called AWS Combini, and then we start sticking in items. So you can either stick them in in a form view or JSON, and the structure is very JSON-like. Unlike SQL, you don't have to have a consistent structure between your objects, but I do here because I want you know, them to all have a price and a name and the inventory count. And then you can start seeing the table. Notice that when we do a scan or a read on the table, there's a cost. It says certain read units are con consumed. So this is one of the ways of Dynamo being billed as pay for what you use. You can see the partition key and the sort key. Um, there's an option to make a new table item. And then one of the ways I punted was storing images is a lot of work. I just used emoji because it had enough symbols that I wanted. So that was a way I simplified this toy problem. So yeah, there's our table. Another way I punted is I have a separate table for the basket. A lot of Dynamo experts will recommend single table design, and that is a good goal to eventually move towards. But when you're starting out, it's okay to just do the easier way and then, you know, make that learning curve smooth so that you don't have to try to, you don't get overwhelmed in the details. And as far as cost, you can use the pricing calculator to really understand if I ran this table at a year at the way I've provisioned for it, it would cost me about eight US dollars. So use these tools to stay in control of what you built. Next, we want to talk about Lambda. To talk about this, we really have to understand the difference between server and serverless. So again, I'm going to ask the audience, would you rather pay to run compute resources 24-7 and you get the fun of maintaining an OS? And or um, you can choose to pay on demand for short running compute resources, and then you don't have to think about the OS. So which would you choose? The answer is really going to depend on the kind of problem you need to solve. If you need a backend server that's running a search engine that's available 24-7, you'll probably need something, a server model, and something like EC2. This gives you a lot of availability. Um, it does. You do have some more responsibility, but if you need that always available, you can, you can do that. Um, if you want to have short-running jobs and you just just want to think about the function, Lambda is the better choice. So these functions are triggered in response to events. They run for a maximum of 15 minutes, and they have automatic scaling. So if you need a 
a lot to run in parallel on demand, it can handle that. AWS handles the administration, the OS for you. And while that's fun and great to learn, it is a lot of work. So, you know, you don't have to think about it. And it comes in one of many programming languages. So for the convenience store, we need to write functionality to manage products, getting one by ID, getting all of them, and then the basket interactions, such as creating a new basket, updating, and completing a purchase. So the example function in Python, I've simplified it so I can show it on the screen here, but a couple of the key points are we're using a library called Boto3. Um, and again, I did this in Python because the Python support in AWS is a little better. But um, yeah, Boto3 is the Dynamo client. So we can here like um, connect to the database. Then for the function handler, when we get an HTTP request, we will basically um, scan the table name. We're going to get all the products. I have this helper here that's called convert DB to JSON product. It's brought in via something called a layer that lets us reuse code between Lambda functions. So it's a little more advanced, but it, it helps clean up the code. And then we return an HTTP status that says, okay, we got it. And we put the products in there. And the web UA is the way I developed it. Again, you might not use this in a production system. You might use more of a build pipeline, but just doing this small, I liked that I could kind of test it out here. And it was a good, it was a good way to start. Next, we need to expose our functionality via an API. So we use API gateway. There are two flavors. One is called HTTP API. The other is called REST. It's a confusing naming because they're both REST, but just remember that the HTTP one is the newer one and it's cheaper. So I recommend that. You can connect it to many different integrations, but we're gonna connect it to Lambda because that's what we built. So you can see the endpoints I've made and the products get, we're gonna connect to the Lambda that I just wrote. Last, with our API, we'll always have to think about our friend cross-origin resource sharing. You'll start getting little errors when you connect your front end that says you can't, you can't go to that different domain. So you'll have to tell it, and there's a place to configure it. I spent too much time on this, but you always have to do it. So you'll have to put in the origins that you're using. So I'll put the local host, um, and later, later we'll have to come back and put the cloud front address. Uh, you could put a wildcard too, depending on your preference. For the website hosting, we need to put it on S3. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this a little quickly, but basically we um, S3 is a data storage mechanism where we store data in buckets. We uh, can do static websites on it, and we can put access control to see who can get that bucket. Making a bucket public has some risks in terms of cost and security, so use it with caution. I'm not going to make a public bucket here. So first we need to make a bucket. And one thing that's interesting is they have to have a globally unique name. Nobody else in the world picked AWS Combini. Hooray, I got there first. So that's what my bucket is called. Then we put the code in it. I'm using Bitbucket and through OIDC Connect was able to set up a pipeline to automatically deploy my code. I don't have time to go in this in detail, but there are great articles online to look it up. And then you see that you've got your built front end, which is a React website. And it's it's here. Hooray. Uh, we need to tell S3 that it's hosting a website. We need to tell it where the index document and error document are. Since I'm using React Router, I just point both to the index HTML document. And now to actually see it, since our bucket is not public, we use CloudFront. CloudFront is a content delivery network for AWS. It is a globally distributed network of proxy servers and data centers. So it basically gets your data close to the client, which creates low latency. You can add other tooling in there too, like traffic encryption or access control. And the pricing is really good. One terabyte data transfer out on the free tier. So we go in, we set up, it's called a distribution. We basically say, I want a CloudFront CDN, point it to this S3 website. And then this is the big reveal. 
we can put it all together. And this is what the website I made looks like. And I have a recording of interacting with it. Basically, every time we do a click there, it's doing a put request to update the shopping cart. So that is going through, um, I mean, it's getting the site through CloudFront and S3 down to your client. And then the put request is going to API Gateway through Lambda and then Dynamo and then back to the client. So it worked. I got it. Yeah, I got it implemented. It was a lot of work, but it was fun. And I I'm, think the final result came out pretty cute. Last, I want to talk about certifications, because this is a direction you can take in your um, AWS learning journey. So there are different types of certifications depending on the level of your career. If you're brand new to tech or you're in a less technical role like product management or UX, maybe you go for the foundational cloud practitioner and it can just give you a basic understanding of the AWS serv services. The one I just took in August and passed was the Solution Architect Associate. So I've used AWS in the past, but I haven't used it deeply. Um, and I thought that one was a good level. Professional is recommended if you have two or more years. And the specialty really depends on the exam. But there's a lot of different flavors of it depending on what career path you want. Now, why get certified? These certifications cost about $150 a significant amount of time for studying and then taking the exam. And we've all seen there is definitely a, a lot of certificate, certificates we see on LinkedIn that are basically like, congrats, you watched 10 hours of video. And maybe you were a good student and you were engaged in taking notes. Maybe you just put on the video and didn't pay attention. It doesn't mean a lot. So some certificates mean more than others. These actually carry a lot of weight. They're widely respected in the industry. They're hard to pass and they can help you get new work, whether you want a new job or a promotion or a freelancer that wants more credibility or my company is a consulting company. So it makes us look good when we go into work and we say, hey, we're certified in these AWS skills. They also keep you up to date because AWS is always changing. For preparation, expect to study for weeks to months. Don't just walk in blindly and think, we'll see. Um, this is one you're going to really need to put some work into. There are training materials through AWS. Some are free, some are paid, some are really good. Some are a bit meandering. I find like maybe they go into more depth than you need. So I think you'll have to kind of review the study guide and maybe ask other people what the best study plan is. There are other paid services that give a more curated study plan, such as Udemy, a Cloud Guru, and LinkedIn Learning. And I've done a Cloud Guru and a LinkedIn Learning course, and I think the combination of those reinforced a lot of skills. Hands-on practice is also really important. Just set up a test account and get in there and explore. That will really help you remember rather than just reading. Be ready for the challenge and know how the exam works to get your best chance of success. Passing scores, scores I think are about a, out of a thousand points, which are not assigned evenly, but about 700 range is going to be a passing score depending on the exam. And um, some of the questions are just tests for future exams. So some of the questions are unscored. So understand how it works. It will give you a better chance of success. Also, Give yourself permission to fail. One of the leaders at my company told me, oh, you know, I failed those sometimes. And it just helped me relax because I felt like everyone around me was passing. And so it happens. You can retake after 14 days. Just don't, don't have a perfectionist mindset. Do your best, but it happens. For testing, you can take in-person or online proctored. Uh, again, this is a matter of personal preference. The testing centers, they feel kind of like the DMV or just sort of the soulless corporate space, but they're just, you know, you do it, you get out, and you can go give yourself a treat. If you do it at home, you can control the space more, but you have to clean your apartment and someone will be monitoring you. I don't know. I choose the, the testing center because I'll just, I'll just deal with it. There's an upcoming certification opportunity offered by AWS. It's called AWS Cloud Up for Her. It's a flexible 16-week program, so it's free to join. Starts in November, and they'll give you a discount on the exam voucher. It's aimed at the Solution Architect Associate. 
looks really cool and it's great to see Amazon supporting women in this way. So please check that out. And final thoughts on your AWS learning path is start simple, break down a problem and it helps us make forward progress. Don't let great be the enemy of good because otherwise you just never finish. Um, learn foundations, you know, treat AWS like a toolbox. You will get different tools and you will, if you understand the basics of how they work, you will have more breadth when you go in to solve a problem. Lastly, stay up to date. AWS is always changing. Your certs will re need renewal after three years and stay curious and keep learning because there are so many cool things that I couldn't put in this talk due to time, but I just personally, I feel like this is just the beginning and I'm going to learn so much more about all this stuff. I hope you will too. Thank you. And if you want to connect with me, here's my email. Oh, that was a really interesting. Um, and I had no idea how complex the AWS toolkit was and how much there was <laughs> to it and all of the work you put into your presentation. It was incredible. Um, we did have a question in the comments um, from Valeria. And um, I wonder if we could get this put on the screen, if that's possible, from our, our wizard in the Ooh, back. Yeah. So great. So I am planning to take the cloud practitioner in December. I would like to take the next um, developer. My question is, what is the time approximation in months for preparation for the developer exam? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I might actually take the developer next, too, because it, it sort of overlaps with the architect. Um, the solutions architect one. Uh, for me, I was fortunate that I could spend some of my working day um, studying for it and watching like the cloud guru training and doing the LinkedIn learning. So I think it took me about a month of just going through the videos. But again, it's hard to just sit down and just go through the videos straight because you'll you'll go you'll kind of go mad. It's too much. Um, it is good to space it out with other things. What I did like about it is they had a lot of labs, but I kind of need to do, I can't just listen. So I started in July and then I took the exam at the end of August. So for me, it was about two months of study of pretty intense study. Um, if you are doing it after hours on like you're doing it on weeknights or weekends, you might have to stretch out your study plan to three to six months, depending on how you, I would just say, like, go through the material, expect to spend a couple months. And then when you get to a point where you feel like you're 70% through it, schedule that exam um, just to kind of keep pushing you through. These are, again, just estimates. and But you can talk with your um, people leader, too, at your company if your company would allow you to study on work time or, like, put a percentage of your week into, um, you know, if you go into that integration, do talk about how it will benefit. Hey, this will benefit my job if I get certified in this because I will fill in the gaps on AWS or I'll be more prepared to help with this. Uh, but I think it is a real um, a real boost in your career to have these certificates and be able to. It's not like the paper. It's I mean, it's a PDF, honest. It's like the paper, but it's more just like you've opened a door of new knowledge and that that's empowering. No, we completely agree. I mean, the upskilling is something that we um, talk a lot about here at Women Who Code. And you did give a suggestion of talking to your manager about maybe using some work time to upskill because it's ultimately going to benefit you at your job. Do you have any, and I do see another um, thoughtful question in the comments as well, but do you have any other tips for our, our members about balancing upskilling with full-time work? And a lot of people are also mothers and have ho hobbies. And mm -hmm. what, do you have any other recommendation for bal balancing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just good to do like small steps. What they say, a journey of a thousand miles is, you know, just say laid up of like single steps or something. Um, sometimes if you just say, okay, I only have 30 minutes a day or I've just, but, but just be consistent and be regular and you'll see over time, you'll sort of chip away at things. Um, find community too, to sometimes when you're doing it alone, it can be hard, but that AWS cloud up for her, AWS has basically just said, we're going to give you a community and a structure and free training. I wish I knew about that, but I'm telling all my coworkers and women who code about take advantage of stuff like this because it gives a little accountability. And when we're all doing 
many of us are doing remote or hybrid work, sometimes it is hard to show up. So, so that structure or find a study group, make a study group in your women who code network or on the, in the cloud track, you know, these are all ways to help you commit to that goal and just small incremental steps. Perfect. We're winding down on time now. I wonder just in the last 30 seconds, do you have any uh, specialized tools or techniques for debugging serverless applications that you find particularly useful? If you just have like a couple that you yeah. could share. I didn't, I want to get into this more, but basically if you use the uh, UI web thing, it will give you this um, test button and you can send the incoming request and you could choose what is your Lambda input. And so I was like, it's an HTTP request. It has the shape. And then, so I would, I would test it with that and then I would see the output. So I was just doing small tests. It was very manual. I don't know. Actually my, my, goal next week is to work with a quality engineer and figure out a more robust way. So I don't fully know the best answer, but I know that there's a like small debugging tools in the UI version. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Anne. And if anyone wants to reach out, um, she has shared her contact information here. Um, thank you everyone so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference time. And thanks so much, Anne, for this helpful presentation. Thank you.